Two of my students, who uh, also are Lovgren and Henry Kama, who uh, wrote thesis about 10 years ago, they, they had uh, one or two chapters uh, on smoking and, and they had uh, an addictive model. So usually a lot of our economic analysis assumes that you have a, an ordinary utility function. Uh, if you have an addictive function, things get a lot more complicated because in an addictive function, your smoking depends also on your utility of smoking in the past. And so uh, you can get some strange behavior and, and the policy conclusions are sometimes different. One of the policy conclusions is that it's really important to stop people from starting smoking. And I suppose, yeah, one of the arguments, in fact, actually for taxing is that that it makes quite a big difference when you're young and really have not very much money. And so it's, you, you kind of want the, that effect. You want to make it inaccessible for youngsters. But then maybe, again, maybe other instruments are, are more powerful or maybe you need a combination of instruments. Again, maybe you needed a tax signal for 10, 15 years before people start understanding, so maybe there is a lag in behavior. It's, it's uh, I mean, these things are, are quite complicated. So, we started by talking about why there is pollution the problem, then what the menu of instruments. There's two things more, two lists more that I want to talk about. One is the criteria. If we're going to choose an instrument, we need a criteria. And economists have many words for efficiency. Um, most people spend almost all their time lecturing uh, I think most most um, books in environmental economics just talk about efficiency, basically. It's typically the most important instrument. The static efficiency one is... Um, is in, in a moment of time, if we want to get a certain amount of abatement done, we want those agents who can do it cheapest to do it. And the criteria that we use is an equalization of marginal costs. So if the marginal cost of abatement for each agent I is the same, then we have a statically efficient allocation. If we don't have that, and for instance, uh, you know, uh, Hamburg, you are, for instance, uh, abating uh, a lot, and you're so much that your marginal cost is 10 for the last unit, and then Yashoda is abating less, and her marginal cost is 5, then obviously by some kind of, you doing a little bit more, a little bit less abatement, and her doing a little bit more, we could save some money or with the same resources we can get a bigger location. This is a very standard, like, it's almost like that is the heart of, of, you know, of economic reasoning in this area. Dynamic efficiency is to do with what we were talking about in the last course, is how we use resources over time. And basically the criteria there is that the scarcity, for instance, rises at the rate of interest over time, the hoteling rule. Um, I want to talk more about fairness and political feasibility. And I put a lot of effort into one or two chapters on that in, in this book. I think, I think that they are, in practice, more important. And anyway, there's no, there's no risk that the efficiency will get lost, because that's like what most of the profession does. Uh, and uh, it's obviously, it, it, it can also be very important. But who pays? When you really try to uh, 
promote an instrument like my favorite gas taxes, you will immediately get hit by people telling you that this is unfair for this person or for that person or for this category or for that district or for the countryside or for, the, or for whatever. Um, that's what people always react to. Oh, but why am I supposed to pay more? And like those people, they don't like they, you know, they live by the railway line, so they, they take the railway. So well, I can't do that. I have to use my cars. So you you get this sort of this perceived fairness, is typically what people care a lot about, and that has a big effect on whether or not things are politically feasible. And it's a strange and funny debate because the argument is always about the poor and unfortunate. Um, but the, the dirty little secret here is that the political feasibility is really about not hurting the instrument, the interests of the powerful and the rich too much. Because that's, that's what really matters, actually. If you want to get something through, through uh, Parliament, is you, you don't want to hurt the middle class in the, in the capital too much, because they, they're the ones who actually have power. But when they are looking after their own interest, they, never, they don't say that. They don't say, don't touch my Porsche. They always say, oh, what about the poor? Uh, this, would, this instrument might not be good for the poor. So, so you, and then, <coughs> of course, instruments can also have other aspects that are important, like the instrument itself might be quite expensive or difficult to introduce. Then we have conditions. So, it's not like um, a certain instrument is always best for forestry and another instrument is always best for energy and some other instrument always best for chemicals, things depend on which criteria you're looking at, but also at a list of things here, like, for instance, the, the heterogeneity and abatement costs. I will show you that, or, or maybe Jessica will uh, later, but the static efficiency argument depends very much on how different the marginal abatement costs are. Um, if there is a monopoly, for instance, it makes a very big difference to what instrument you might choose. And so, uh, in small countries, there may be a certain industry will automatically be a monopoly. In a big industry, in a big country, it won't. So it depends on what country you're in. Um, obviously, electricity distribution in a small country will typically be one monopoly. In a very big country, why not? You can break it up and you can have it organized as a more or less competitive industry. <coughs> Sometimes we have um, the damage might be the same. Take a, a carbon dioxide molecule that is released, it has uh, the same effect irrespective of whether it's released in Tanzania or in Sweden. But um, the mercury we talked about before, it makes a big difference if the mercury is released into water or into air or into a desert or uh, depends on the ecosystem, the damage that, that you will get. And so our choice of instrument will depend on these things. Property rights is really the most fundamental of all instruments. And I'll talk a little bit about where property rights come from. That was actually the chapter I think that I, I thought was most fun writing this book. Um, most, uh, I learned something. I had vague ideas about where property rights come from. And uh, it's interesting to see. They are different in different societies and different for different kinds of goods. And How many of you know the word enclosure? No one. That's great. Um, so it comes from England, uh, where common, the common land was uh, like grass, just like, uh, un un unenclosed. 
and basically anybody in the village could let their sheep go and graze there and uh, it was just open and unmanaged. And then uh, gradually, over a thousand years of history, um, the powerful people typically appropriated and privatized land. And in England, uh, particularly in historical times, uh, what you did was you, you planted a hedge around the land and then the hedge grew up and uh, it became your property, your fence, basically. So enclosure meant closing in the land and making it private. And today there are, there are environmentalists who um, speak of enclosure in a more gra general sense. And speak of the enclosure of radio frequencies, for instance. So, 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 so basically, when, when you create property rights to radio frequencies, that is a kind of enclosure. You are taking what used to be common property and you're making it private. And we have enclosure uh, of the seas, for instance. From 1940 to 1970, we had a process in the United Nations when gradually the seas were sort of divided up and made property of the nations. And some people say that we are enclosing everything, genetic information, uh, wildlife, uh, space, mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. I think you can buy lots of land on the moon by now as well from some internet company. That's enclosure of the moon. And um, I think maybe we have mixed feelings about this. I think, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, people who think of this is uh, sort of sad and bad and we are privatizing things and making it private. It used to be, you know, like for everybody and then it becomes private. But then on the other hand, as um, having studied a lot of environmental economics, I kind of am persuaded that if things are not owned by someone, they tend to be sort of um, subject to the tragedy of open access. You're not allowed to say tragedy of the commons in this class. Because then Eleanor would be sad. Um, the com common property resource management sometimes works very well. The villagers, for instance, informally manage something. So it's not a tragedy automatically. What is a tragedy automatically is when you have open access and no management at all. That is always going to be a tragedy, so we want to avoid that. So from that perspective, property is good. In that you need some kind of property and some kind of management, but common property, collective ownership can sometimes work just as well or maybe better than private ownership. The problem is when there is no ownership. I'm going to take a little example of a chemical called C2HCl3. Just to vary things a little bit. Does anybody know what this is? Trichloroethylene? It's a really nasty chemical, or it's a really great chemical. It's, um, it removes fat immediately. So, if you have been to a small sort of mechanical industry, like a, one of these places that maybe makes little, um, oh, I don't know, like water heaters. So you're going to make a water heater, the most important central part is a little tank where, you, where the water is. And you make that by, you have a sheet of metal and you cut it to the right size and then you weld it together and then you get, you get your tank. Right? Um, well, if you want to do this rationally, then maybe you cut uh, like 500 pieces of metal first one day and then like a few weeks later you, 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 you weld them. And then, so to protect so you don't get rust, when you cut the metal, you put some grease on, just ordinary fat. 
and then when you're going to weld it, you have to take the fat away. That's when you want to use trichloroethylene. You dip it in trichloroethylene, and the fat is gone. The trouble is that the guy, the worker, who uses this, the fat around his nerves is also gone. So the the unfortunate guy on the painting on the picture there, I think, is a painter who used this as a solvent and is now in some kind of rehabilitation program. Um, apparently, you can you can quite easily see which people have been affected by this. It has a really bad effect on your brains. Um, and so in Sweden, this chemical was forbidden in 1991. Um, but that got Sweden into a lot of trouble, because there are German producers of this chemical, they, they, they sued Sweden and said, this is our product, you can't, you know, you're in the U European Union, you can't prohibit us. And there were lots of industries. Uh, this is an advertisement, a protest, uh, written as an open letter to the Prime Minister, who was called Ingvar Karlsson at the time, saying that if you prohibit this chemical, we will move our industries abroad. So I cut out the, this and I gave it to the student a few years later and said, you know, this might be an idea for your bachelor's thesis. Why don't you call these industries and see if they really moved or what happened? So he did. And we wrote some papers about trichloroethylene. And one thing we did was we actually calculated a marginal cost of abatement curve. I could tell you that's a lot of work. Usually we just do like this. That's really easy. That's when you're a lecturer. <laughs> but if you really want to, uh, to do an empirical marginal cost of abatement curve, you have to go out and talk to these people in these industries. And sometimes they don't really want to talk coherently to you because they've been using trichloroethylene for a number of years, so they can't, they don't, they hardly understand what the problem is. Right? And um, but then we, you know, we so we tried to ask them what would it cost you to use something else. And there were all kinds of producers selling other solutions. You could use boil lemons in water and use that instead. All kinds of other stuff. <coughs> so we tried to work, we asked them what would it cost you and then we kind of, you know, by using this uh, we got this marginal cost of abatement curve. And what do you see when you look at this? This took Daniel like three months to make this diagram. Because each of these dots is a day spent with a company. Basically, because sometimes they would say, "Oh, well, it, you know, it would be easy to reduce to 30 percent, but then it becomes more difficult." And, you know, so sometimes it's a long story. Sometimes a few of them said it would cost like really astronomical amounts. You know. So most people sort of, I mean, some companies said they would save money. You sort of wonder, well, why don't they just do it? No. Um, some companies said it would cost them less than 50 kroner, that was most of them. And then there were a few who gave us really high numbers. These were the people who'd you know, been the most active in signing this letter and were really angry. Um, so maybe they exaggerated the numbers because they were angry. I mean, you don't know if people are telling you the truth. But it could also be the case, sometimes I, one guy had his little, sort of, his little shop, in, like in a garage somewhere, and um, he said that, well, you know, if I, if I could use, like, boiling water and lemon peel and stuff, but that equipment is bigger, 
and there's no space in my garage. So then I'd have to move to another place. And if I move, that would take me three months and I would lose these customers. And then he made a whole list. And he made quite a good argument that this really would cost a lot of money. So I kind of became a little persuaded. Yeah, sometimes it might be very expensive. So, what do we do? What instrument is best when you have a, a marginal cost curve like that? I mean, there's no like one answer to that question. But Daniel and I said, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, why not? Why not just have a tax of 50 kroner per kilo? Then most of the companies will just choose to do, you know, to, to swap technologies. And the last companies where it's really difficult, well, they won't swap the first year, that's for sure. Maybe they will learn from the other companies that it's not so difficult. Or maybe, you know, with time they would, you know, or we'll deal with them later or something. Because the prohibition was causing a lot of problems, it was being challenged in the courts, we had a lot of legal fights, and so nothing was actually happening. Anyway, the, f the fun thing was Norway did what we suggested here, they chose a tax. So, uh, this is what happened with the prohibition. The, the, the total ban, it turns out, is not that total. So if you remember my, my, my instrument menu before, you think a ban, ah, well then you get zero emissions. Well, not necessarily. That assumes that the ban really passes, but then some companies continue to cheat, some companies fight the, the EPA and the ministry in the, in the courts, and if they don't win in the courts, they go to the European courts, and this all takes 15 years. So the emissions don't actually go to zero even with a ban, not necessarily. Otherwise you might think that a ban has the advantage that emissions go to zero, but it's not very flexible. A tax has some other advantages, but here actually it's not that, it's not that clear. <coughs> the ban has the risk of being fought in court, yeah. Exactly. This Swedish health um, engineers had, had identified this problem a long time ago. And so there's a long list of policies here and they started very much as actually SKF in Gothenburg uh, because they were such a big dominant user. So I, I spent a day with the environmental head of SKF once and we talked about this. And, and like for SKF, there was internally, there was a whole sort of cost of abatement because they could, they could reduce the first 20% like this and the next 20% like this. And they used trichloroethylene for lots of things. You know that a ball bearing, um, if there is a, a micro droplet of water on a ball bearing for more than like 10 seconds, it is ruined by corrosion. <laughs> Their standards are very high. Right? So, um, they have to be really sure that they get rid of all water from the, their ball bearings. And they used, well, they can use lots of things. And they used to use, um, I mean, well, there was a time when they used, um, uh, trichloroethylene, and then trichloroethylene was actually replaced by CFCs. You know what CFCs are? Chlorofluorocarbons. They were great because they were not poisonous at all. They don't react very much with anything. That's what's nice about them, so they don't have much of a health effect. The trouble is that they don't react with anything and then they drift up into the stratosphere and 10, 20 years later, they get a lot of CFCs up in the stratosphere. And up there, they are chemically active. And they destroy the formation of ozone molecules. They catalyze their reconversion to oxygen. And so, um, 
So that was a big problem for the destruction of the ozone layer. And so the CFCs were banned, and the company started using trichloroethylene again, which is bad for the workers' health. So you see these trade-offs between, between environmental policies are, are, are tricky. And so, uh, so basically the EPA worked with, with SKF and got them to... Uh, and we learned lots of interesting things from, 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 from SKF. One was that they, um, uh, when they banned the use of, of trichloroethylene in Gothenburg, they banned it over the globe in SKF facilities. As I said, they, we don't want a, a, a journalist in Brazil sort of saying that, ah, in Sweden they don't do it, but here they continue to poison our workers. Uh, like that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't look like good policy. <coughs> so anyway, we had a nice comparison between four countries. There was Sweden, where we had the ban, and well, we had this big decline first, before the ban, because of just ordinary regulation. And then we had the ban, which kind of reduced use, but not down to zero. We had Norway, where they were not using as much per capita, but still, they were using some. And then they got this tax, and with the tax, the, practically the use stopped. We had Germany, where um, Germany believes they have the best chemical engineers in the world. Ah, oh, the best engineers in the world, period. And so they, um, uh, they said, well, if there's a problem, German engineers are going to solve it. So they put very high requirements. I think instead of parts per million, they have parts per billion in the, in the air in the factory as a requirement, like one or two parts per billion. And they have created these closed loop machines that use trichloroethylene, and which they then created an export market. So they sell these machines all over the world, like the best machines that's sort of safest for the environment. So they turn the problem into an export opportunity. Um, Sweden now buys these machines, but we still can't use trichloroethylene because it's illegal but we use perchloroethylene, which is very similar <laughs> in these machines. And so, and then another interesting thing is the rest of Europe is here. So one conclusion of this article was, you need some policy, otherwise nothing happens. Uh, but it's hard to say which of the policies is best. Strict regulation, tax, or ban. Maybe each of them has their merits and their problems. Well, it was <laughs> it's a bit of a hump there. I think, I think not, but I'm not quite sure. I think, uh, I think that um, we never found a single company that actually did move or close down. I think it's often an empty threat. Um, SKF certainly didn't move. And many of these other places were much too small to really move anyway. So. so uh, Equal abatement, uh, marginal abatement cost curves. This is something that um, uh, Jessica will lecture more about. Uh, the idea being, as I mentioned before, that you don't want one, one company to be paying a, a very high marginal cost of abatement and another one very low. Um, you want then the the company with the cheaper abatement to do more so that you get the marginal cost of abatement equalized. 
And I put a lot of work into a, a chapter there calculating exactly how much more with linear curves. So you'll find that in, in the book as well. And you'll find that actually kind of is part of the case study that we will be doing is, has to do with this. So that's, that's something I'm hoping you'll read soon. Um, we already talked a little bit about what happens when you have heterogeneous damage, that is, the damage is different in different places. This is a, a tradable permit. So, this is the right for Thomas Turner to emit one ton of sulfur dioxide somewhere in the United States. When Bush was president, I was thinking of, you know, emitting it over the White House. But there are local restrictions there. That's not allowed. <coughs> so, this is an instrument, I don't know how many of you sort of have a, have a good feeling for how, how permit trade works. Nominally, these are like sort of documents like this. In reality, they are just numbers in a computer registry. And um, the biggest example, uh, big, the first big example was, was um, uh, of, of permit trade was actually the uh, reduction of sulfur in the United States. The uh, U.S. government decided they would um, reduce emissions from their coal plants by half. And there were a lot of debates about how expensive this would be. And uh, so, so, for instance, um, you know, there would be public discussion about this before, before the policy. And, uh, and people estimated somewhere around a thousand dollars per ton. And so that's that's a lot of money. And so they were saying, well, we can't we can't cut emissions by half because it will cost you know a thousand. You calculate how many tons and how many dollars that is. And it's much too expensive. But this brings us to the same problem as we had with this marginal abatement cost curve for trichloroethylene. How do you know what it's going to cost? And as long as it's a regulation, typically it will be some young engineer uh, who will have to figure out what it costs. And he has no incentive to come up with a low number because basically his boss has just told him that, you know, prove how difficult this policy will be because we want to stop the EPA from, from you know, making the suggestion into law. And and then you had a bunch, you know, so you got, you got some serious engineers from, from these power companies saying this is going to be very expensive. And then you have some flimsical economists saying, oh no, but if we have trading, it will all magically be very cheap. And uh, typically, I think, you know, a lot of people would believe more in the engineers than in the economists. And on this one occasion, the economists were right. The prices turned out to be about a hundred, between a hundred and two hundred dollars. And why is that? It's not because the engineers can't count. We know they're usually better at uh, counting than the economists. But the thing is that it's a very different situation if, if you have a an engineer who is told to kind of figure out what this costs, but we're hoping it's not going to happen anyway. Uh, or if you have a program where you actually trade with these permits, because it's not an, a young engineer anymore, it's the board of the company that deals with it. It's a lot of money. And the board will be very creative. And they say, okay, well, so if fluidized beds are very expensive, we won't do fluidized beds, we'll do something else. They solved the whole 
the whole sort of uh, um, a large part of the of, of the problem by closing all the coal mines in the east of the United States, and they found clean sulfur coal in in the west of the United States. They deregulated the railways. They built new railway lines. Some people made a lot of money, and then they shipped that coal, you know, to the power plants. We're speaking very big, you know, operations, and and they could deliver sulfur with lower uh, coal with lower sulfur contents, and they could they didn't have to buy all that expensive equipment, and they could meet their you know sulfur requirements more easily. So I bought my permit for about one hundred and twenty-five dollars. That's. Uh, we're going to speak about that quite a lot. That's a really good question. Um, the, uh, there was a time when economists would say it doesn't really matter. You could kind of throw them out of a helicopter uh, wow. or whatever. Um, the, the part we are interested in, you know, the efficiency, uh, is irrespective of how they are distributed because uh, whoever owns them will sort of sell them to those who need them the most and the marginal cost of, uh, uh, of abatement will be equalized and that's the part that is the efficiency part that we care about. Now it turns out in reality that it's, it's much more complicated and there are um, I don't know, at least three or four very important and different ways. One is auction. That is, you sell them to whoever wants to buy them. No. That's kind of special, because that also implies, just by coincidence, that all the revenue goes to the state, and the state kind of is the owner of the resource. Or you can hand them out free. which means that the polluter or someone else gets the rent. But then, if you're handing out something valuable for free, you have to have some kind of a method, right? Now, you could give it to your friends, that's called corruption, that's also quite a, you know, uh, plausible mechanism. You could, you could do it per capita, That has actually been done with real resources, real money. The, the oil wealth in, Aust in Alaska is partly allocated that way. So the revenue from the, from the oil in Alaska is given to the people who live in Alaska, which is not very many people. So they get quite a big check at the end of each year. It's like a compensation for living in Alaska. A negative lump sum tax. So that's one method. Um, this is a method that I'm currently writing, uh, or just finished writing a paper with, together with Eleanor Ostrom, who died right in the middle of this paper, and, and two other authors. Grandfathering, which basically means if we were, if someone closed the doors here and we were had to spend three days here and there was a small ration of food in here, we could divide it up and we could <coughs> give the people who are fat and big more because we're used to eating more. I say we because I think I would be a winner in this. Uh, right? Okay, so um, um, in proportion to body mass, that would be a reasonable, you know, I mean, there, there's some physiological ground for that. We are used to eating more, so we need to eat more. Um, so the polluting companies get more. The more polluting they are, they, the more they get. Or you can have output allocation. That is, the more you produce of a useful good, uh, the more you get. That assumes that you can actually measure 
the amount of useful production. So we will talk about all these in, uh, throughout because they turn out to have different efficiency properties and also different uh, perceptions of fairness and therefore different political feasibility. The very important sort of issues. Yep. Like you mentioned, pollution.